also is becoming smaller, you know, in terms of technology. It is, and uh, that's the uh, the group that I run is the NASA's Small Spacecraft Technology Development Program. As we are starting to embrace even more the use of small spacecraft to conduct real science and real exploration missions. And uh, my job in the group that I work with is to improve the um, the rate at which many of these small spacecraft technologies are being developed so that we could extend the range of these small spacecraft beyond low Earth orbit, which has been their traditional operating domain. Get them into cislunar space, get them into planetary space and beyond. Wow. So are there any similar terms as generations or it is size wise we define them? Uh, civilizations? I'm sorry, what? Re repeating? Uh, how do we classify them into various? Uh, are there sizes fixed for particular technologies? Or oh. Yeah, it's interesting because um, the, the NASA small spacecraft, they consider um, if it's less than 180 kilograms, which I consider to be rather large, <laughs> to be a small spacecraft, it's if they can, if we can put it, uh, attach it to the portal of any of uh, ports on an Esper ring, then we consider it a small spacecraft. And uh, most of the ones that I've been working with are generally in the 3U to 6U to 12U size with those uh, particular CubeSats. But we're going to um, develop another, um, a different shape, different uh, form fit function that we hope to demonstrate within a couple of years that uh, will be another option that uh, scientists can choose for conducting small spacecraft missions. Uh, we'll see how it works. We're not, uh, we haven't flown this before, but it'll be different than a CubeSat. But we think it will add some capabilities that uh, CubeSats don't have today. So we shall see. Whoa. So how many will be on the, um, the, the webinar today? Yeah, Anubhuma has some data, Risha. Yeah, uh, sir, we have mailed the uh, meet joining link as well as the streaming link. So if possible for them to join through the Google Meet, they will join here and others will be watching uh, live streaming of the session. Okay. Oh, thank you. And uh, uh, we have received over 250 uh, or 300 registrations, I think, Anupma. Or 400 registrations for this event. Okay. Well, I'll have um, generally two topics, the small spacecraft technology development and then I will do a, a look back on the net, the legacy of the Kepler mission that I ran for about six years. And at the end, I'll touch on some upcoming missions that will be uh, conducted this year. I think you'll find pretty exciting. Uh, the launch of our next rover to Mars. And then later on this year, we have a spacecraft OSIRIS-REx, which has been orbiting an asteroid called Bennu. And uh, we're going to do a, a touch of the asteroid and collect the sample from its surface and then <clears throat> bring the sample back to Earth for analysis. So what are the future missions? Yes. Um, well, besides the new rover, which launches uh, in late July, if they stay on schedule, uh, that one's called Perseverance, but it also has a technology demonstration attached to it. I'll show you an animation of that in today's presentation. Uh, next year, uh, where there's, I think there's some pretty exciting missions going in 2021. One is a uh, the double asteroid redirect uh, mission which NASA is going to rendezvous with the Didymos binary asteroid system and do a strike on one just to see if we can move the orbit of the secondary asteroid in that binary system to a slightly different orbit. In case you want to deflect an asteroid in your future that could be on a collision course with Earth. <laughs> but uh, also in uh, 2021, you'll see the, the first launch of Artemis with the new Orion capsule on it. And hopefully we'll see the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope as well. 
So uh, this year and next year are uh, filled with pretty uh, interesting events for us. Well, So how are things in um, India with the pandemic? Uh, are you guys sheltering in place for some time to come or how is that uh, being worked there? Has been expanding. Initially, it had a very safe and slow start. But now, as far as spread is concerned, it's spreading. Though some recovery rate is benefit beneficial, somewhat improving. However, uh, the spread is unstopping, unstoppable mm. as, far, as far as present data shows. So it's probably embracing the whole country. Of course, there are dense pockets. I, I find it wherever there is more development, uh, it is you know more population density, closer working. So obviously it finds you know easy, easy and fast spread. Yes. Yeah. That's so what... yeah, some capital places in the country have been severely hit. You know, Mumbai particularly and Delhi capital, and there's one south part of India, Chennai. These are the top few, and uh, place like Chandigarh has reasonably very, very low compared to the other cities. Mm. So we have you know, less than 100 cases uh, active, what we call active cases now. Okay. And, and a few deaths. The percentage of deaths also is low as far as overall country is concerned so far. And, uh, so still not yet controlled. Well, it's pretty much um, uh, can by depending upon whom you listen to, but uh, if you look at the numbers here in the, what we call our Sunbelt states, this, the Southern tier of the United States, it's uh, pretty much almost out of control there now, especially in the larger cities. We've reached uh, over 130,000 deaths and about two and a half million in infections you know, nationwide. Uh, it, it's uh, part of it's because you, know, I think some people became uh, restless, did not like sheltering in place, and I think some of the governors opened up businesses a little too early. In uh, summertime, of course, people want to be outside <laughs> and mingling with other people. Some patience, some restlessness. Yes. Also, yeah. It's it's a big test on the whole world. Yes, it is. Uh, it's going to have an impact for some time to come until we get some better treatments and some vaccines. Seems to be passing through a tunnel. You don't know where the tunnel will end, where is the other end of the tunnel. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we don't know whether it's bright enough or reasonable enough. Yes. So we, we are all in finger crossed. That's for sure. Yes. Science will hopefully lead us away out of it. Yes. Yes. Science, of course. Yes, <laughs> good science. But so much, so much of development in science is occurring, so much of work is happening now within this last three months. While still has not conquered the pandemic yeah. or the virus, but at least a lot of working scientific groups have worked together, are working together. Uh, yes, there is There's a lot of uh, worldwide consortiums working on bringing better treatments and vaccines to the battle. So hopefully that uh, we'll see some improvements in the not too distant future. Uh, it seems to be a compressed working of science within months. Yes. The trials so. that the trials that used to take years are now happening faster, as much as possible, because yep. there are patients also appearing as fast as possible. Yes. So so probably hope to see that uh, you know end of the tunnel. Yes, I hope so. Yeah, we all wish and hope. <laughs> so, Anupama, shall we? Is it time? Yes, sir. We can start with your confirmation. Yeah, please. Okay. So, greetings to all global community. And I'm Anupama Thakur, Chair of I2P ACSIR CSIO Student Branch Chandigarh. 
So I welcome you to the IEEE Virtual Talk Series 2020. So today we have with us a, a very uh, keynote speaker from NASA. And this will really be a phenomenal virtual session. So thank you for joining us. So to start today's session, firstly, I invite our IEEE branch counselor, Dr. H.K. Sardana, for his welcome address. Yes, sir. Welcome, uh, welcome, good evening, good morning, all over the, the honorable speaker and the delegates. It's really nice to listen to, rather looking forward to listening to Roger Hunter, who has kindly agreed uh, in this pandemic time to share and bring us to another space where we know the social distancing in the real space has already troubled us. So we'll be relieved, I hope, with a journey with uh, you know small spacecraft technology that we agreed to share. We hope to have some relief from the day-to-day -day working that we have. And uh, we look forward to this interaction be a memorable one for researchers all over the world and scientists and other faculty members who would like to get a peep of this small spacecraft technology. So over to Anupama to welcome and invite him with his uh, brief. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, sir, for opening the session. So I extend a red carpet welcome to our speaker, that is, uh, Mr. Roger Hunter, so with over 40 years experience in U.S. Department of Defense, Commercial and Government Space Missions, Roger Hunter sir, has currently served as Program Manager for NASA's Small Spacecraft Technology. In this capacity, for the past four plus years, he identifies and supports the development of new subsystem technologies to expand the capabilities of small spacecraft for NASA science and exploration objectives. Previously, he served for six years as the program manager for the NASA's Kepler mission. The Kepler mission's principal scientific objective has been to determine the frequency of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of other stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So while working in the commercial space industry, Roger was also the program manager for the Boeing Corporation Global Positioning System Sustainable Activities for the US Air Force. So with this brief intro, I welcome you, sir, for your session. Yes, over to you, sir. Thank you so much for the kind introductions. I, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, good evening, India. I, um, I do have two topics to discuss today, and as mentioned in the introduction, I want to talk about NASA's small spacecraft activities, particularly in the area of space technology. But as you can see from this chart, um, there are other areas that NASA is embracing small spacecraft uh, for exploration and science. And uh, if you are aware of the recent uh, history, we used two small spacecraft uh, in interplanetary space already as they escorted the Mars InSight lander to um, its destination a couple of years ago. And we're now using small spacecraft in low Earth orbit to provide Earth observation for uh, weather pattern uh, and weather in, uh, science. And those two areas are on this, as you see on this chart, are indicated on the right. But I will be spending my time with today's lecture talking about space technology, the development of technologies that will enable future science and future exploration missions that take advantage of the rapid development in electronics and technologies that has given us the opportunities to use the uh, continued development of technologies that miniaturize components so that we can actually use them in smaller spacecraft that we can now actually conduct real science and exploration missions with them. But I'll be talking with you about the development of technology in those areas uh, after I address the small spacecraft activities, I will also have a short look back on the NASA Kepler mission for which I was the program manager for six years. And I will um, give you a brief synopsis on where we ended with the mission. Here are the objectives of the office that I work with. And as I sort of hinted on the previous chart, 
the revolution in electronics technology that has allowed us to miniaturize so many components, we are now taking advantage of that miniaturization to build these much smaller spacecraft that in many cases are becoming as capable as larger spacecraft from a decade or more ago. This is allowing us to actually lower the cost of a number of these missions and reduce the time between the conduct of different missions if we're conducting sequential missions and also enables us to actually build new mission architectures. For example, think of using a swarm of these small spacecraft as a means for investigating a science object of interest, so as such as an asteroid. This um, advancement in technologies, particularly for propulsion systems and communication systems and power subsystems are allowing us to uh, actually move the spacecraft to new destinations. We are already going to Mars with these. I have another spacecraft launching early next year that's going to go to the moon and conduct some exploration activities there. And finally, we think that we can actually use these small spacecraft to augment existing assets for future missions. Just think of these as being a ride along deployable for us, a, a larger spacecraft. Uh, as use your imagination, think of going to the moon Enceladus around Saturn and investigating the water plumes, the water geysers that have been seen coming off that moon by the Hubble Space Telescope and by Cassini. A spacecraft, a mothership with multiple small spacecraft attached to it could actually arrive at Enceladus and that the mothership relaying the deployed small spacecraft findings back to Earth as we investigate whether there is life inside the water that has been detected on that moon. So that's how we're using our imaginations is what's going to guide us for the future and how we're going to use small spacecraft technologies. Where do we get these technologies? As you might expect, they come from multiple sources. NASA uh, does a very nice job, I think, of partnering with uh, multiple institutions around the United States. We get some of our technologies by partnering with universities, sometimes with small businesses, and sometimes we do something called a public-private partnership in which a company will bring some of its investment capital to the table and NASA brings a share and we jointly develop a technology which we think could then be used for opportunities in the future for exploration science or in the case of the private company for its own business needs, mining asteroids. So use your imagination of where some of those public-private partnerships could go as the human race continues to expand its presence beyond the surface of the Earth. And in the end, as you see, when those technologies are present themselves from the laboratories, my organization will then do demonstration missions with them to ensure that they are mature enough before we actually put them into a science or exploration mission. This is an example, this chart here shows an example of where we, the breadth and the depth of our investments with universities over the last several years. And we have reached out to 28 different universities in 18 United States, uh, 18 states of the US. And we partner those universities with different centers across NASA to help mentor those technologies with the professors and with the students they have working with them and we're seeing this as being a very productive activity for NASA for bringing new and exciting technologies out of the laboratories and into NASA's needs for science and explorations. We will continue this for the foreseeable future. And we think this has been a very productive pipeline for us in the past. This is just an example, uh, and I don't want to belabor this because I know this, you know, I particularly don't like using word charts, but my staff asked me to show you this. It gives you an example of the universities that we are reaching out to. And this is from our most recent selection class, STP standing for Small Satellite Technology Partnerships. And we selected about eight different technologies from these different universities for further investigation and further development. And of course, as you might expect, many of these are oriented toward communications, propulsion, or a new navigation and timing system, which will allow us again to start moving these small spacecraft beyond low Earth orbit and out into cislunar and out into planetary space. 
Now, I would like to shift gears with you. I would like to discuss with you some very recent and completed uh, what we call U-Class or CubeSat technology demonstrations, which were very successful. And you can see the hand or a finger in the image here, which gives you a sense of scale. Both of these missions were oriented toward improving communications. The one on the left um, was called the Integrated Solar Array and Reflect Array Antenna. And that was oriented toward KA band communications, showing that you could put KA band communications inside a CubeSat class mission. And you see the antenna that the hand is touching there, it's a flat panel array. And on the other side of the flat panel were solar cells. So we had an integrated solar array and reflector array antenna all in one form uh, function on this particular spacecraft. The one on the right, was also oriented towards communications, but this time it was laser con or optical communications. And this one came in a pair. There were two of these, they were identical because we had a secondary objective with the spacecraft mission on the right to not only demonstrate optical communications from low earth orbit, <clears throat> but to also show proximity operations of the two spacecraft around each other. One on the left did not have a propulsion system, but the one on the right, the OCSD, did have a propulsion system, and it was water. We used uh, a water-based propulsion system for the technology demonstration objectives that we wanted to show in that particular spacecraft after we had completed the communications demonstration. Now, the one on the left, the intent, was to show 100, 100 megabits per second from low Earth orbit. We were successful in demonstrating that. And the one on the right was 200 megabits per second. And we were, we were successful with both spacecraft in demonstrating 200 megabits per second with that demonstration. Now, there's one thing I would like to add on the mission on the left. Uh, you see this 3U size spacecraft body. And when we had completed the spacecraft, we had extra room inside. And to show that we can also be agile. And before we conduct these missions, the Aerospace Corporation came to uh, us and asked if they could uh, host a 1U multispectral imager that worked in the visible long wave and short infrared that would fit in one end of the spacecraft. And it's on the, the end, the near end that you see in here. And after we uh, discussed this with uh, JPL, uh, we said, yes, we could do that. As a matter of fact, it did not uh, have any impact on the rest of the performance of the demonstration. Our only restriction with the Aerospace Corporation for hosting their 1U multispectral imagers that we wanted to finish the KA band communications demonstration first before we allowed them to turn on their 1U multispectral imager. But I want, a reason I bring this up is that I would like to sh show you what you can do from 450 kilometers in orbit with a 1U size multispectral imager. You may recall in the uh, in international news, um, uh, it's coming up almost two years ago. In late November 2018, we had the worst forest fires in California history. And uh, the images you see uh, on this particular chart were taken with the, the three cameras that were on board that 1U multispectral imager on the ICERA spacecraft as we were flying over uh, this part of Northern California at night. And this fire is referred to as a campfire because of a road that was called the camp road in the area. And if you can see my cursor in the image on the far left, and I'm circling the bright spot that's right in the middle of that image, that was uh, the town, it was called Paradise, uh, California. And this was a very destructive fire. And you can see the buildings burning or the embers from the town because the town was completely wiped off the face of the earth uh, in this horrible forest fire. And this was sobering for us to see this. We were fascinated with the technology that we're able to do this with such a small camera at 450 kilometers above the surface. But as these images came into our monitors, uh, it was rather sobering to see this type of destruction going on, on the surface of the Earth. But it gives you an impression that small spacecraft can actually do a very fine job in helping monitor such natural disasters, in this case, forest fires, from an altitude that is basically above what the altitude is that the International Space Station works at. 
Now, I'd like to show you just a quick animation of how the optical communications and sensor demonstration deployed. We launched, and there's two of them coming out together. As I mentioned, there are two identical spacecraft, and you can see the water being expelled like a, a child spitting at you in a sense. <laughs> and then we, um, of course, this animation sped up, and then we used the laser to uh, zap a target, which was a 30 centimeter telescope on top of the Aerospace Corporation headquarters building, which is in El Segundo, California. And that's just south of Los Angeles International Airport. And the animation you see here is, the, of course, sped up, showing the two spacecraft doing proximity operations around each other. With um, the spacecraft, we had them as far apart one time as about 476 kilometers. But we were demonstrating the proximity operations of the two around each other. We had them as close as six meters near each other. But uh, the mission was very successful. And we were able to demonstrate the 200 megabits per second with each spacecraft. And uh, even though most of the testing was done at night, we were actually challenged the team to see if they could actually close the link of the communications, of the optical communications between the spacecraft and the optical telescope on the ground in late afternoon hours. And we could, we actually could detect the six watt laser from 450 kilometers as the spacecraft was coming up over the horizon. And we started looking for the optical telescope of zone the ground on top of the Aerospace Corporation building in El Segundo, California. Now there's one other additional uh, activity I'd like to share with you that involved both of these spacecraft the ICERA spacecraft that had the one U multispectral imager and the two spacecraft on the right that contained the, the optical communications. We wanted to do an additional uh, credit um, uh, activity, a different additional credit experiment in which as both spacecraft missions were orbiting the Earth and their um, respective locations were getting further and further apart, we wanted to see if we could take the laser on one of these small spacecraft that you see uh, in this image and hit the multispectral imager that was on board the ICERA spacecraft. And they were at a distance of 2,200 kilometers. And let me set this up for you. Um, this is where we demonstrated the optical comm between OCSD and the ICERA Cumulos. That was the name of the multispectral imager. We love our acronyms in NASA. But basically, that was the multispectral imager on ICERA. We turned the ICERA spacecraft toward the location of where we believe the OCSD spacecraft are. And they were about 2,200 kilometers apart. And what you're going to see when I run this animation, you see this little white dot that I'm circling with my cursor that's sort of in the lower left center of the screen. That is an infrared star that the cumulus sensor is observing. It's radiating pretty hot in the infrared. So that's... It is not a UFO, it's just a star. It's going to be moving from the 10 o'clock position to the 4 o'clock position. Of course, you can see the limb of the Earth here. And when I run this animation, right in the middle, you will see the 6-watt laser uh, light up and the cumulus, in, there it goes, is staring straight at it. Of course, this animation is sped up and we did a couple of additional experiments which were able to maintain uh, lock on the multispectral imager using the OCSD laser for over three and a half minutes as these spacecraft were orbiting the Earth. And you think about that, they're 2,200 kilometers apart, and they're both moving about 17,500 miles an hour. So that was, we were quite pleased with ourselves that we were able to do that particular demonstration. Now I'd like to move on to some upcoming demonstration missions that uh, NASA is going to be conducting over the next year, year and a half which will also provide us, hopefully, with some technologies coming out of the labs, which will enable further improvements in small spacecraft, whether it's in propulsion or attitude, a better attitude and determination control system, um, even higher bandwidth laser communications. Uh, and a new type of a reflector ray antenna that also combines communications and radar into one antenna. And then another technology in CD is listed at the bottom of this chart. My favorite one is called LISA-T, which stands for Lightweight Integrated Solar Array and Transceiver, which packs quite a bit of power into a very small volume. It's, uh, if you think of a foldable solar array that origamis into 
a space that only occupies about one U of space, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. And when the door opens on that end of the spacecraft, this thing unfurls like a, a spring-loaded origami flower, and you get almost 600 watts out of that. So we got some interesting technologies that are coming along, which we think will allow us to continue to improve the power, comm, propulsion, and processing capabilities of the spacecraft. So that's what PTD, the Pathfinder Technology Demonstrator on the left, does. It reserves about half of its 6U space to host one of these technologies that you see listed on the bottom of this chart, and then we'll be flying those on six-month centers. So every six months, we'll be launching one of these, taking a new technology into low Earth orbit, and getting that technology space qualified. Hopefully, also early next year, we're going to launch the, what we call CPOD, or the CubeSat for Proximity Operations Demonstration. And this is the first time we will demonstrate the rendezvous, proximity operations, and autonomous docking of two, three U-size CubeSats. Um, the one on the right, CPOD, does have a propulsion system. It's very simple, though. It's a cold gas system. Uh, PTD, the bus itself, does not have a propulsion system, but it can host propulsion systems inside the space that is reserved for experiments that we want to take to orbit and qualify. We have a number of other ones that are also coming up in the next uh, year and a half and two years. And you can see these listed across this chart. V-Rex are just three one new size spacecraft that we're going to be demonstrating uh, autonomous ranging between three spacecraft. This is a very fast demonstration that we're quickly building here at NASA Ames with also uh, Stanford uh, University's help. The second one you see here, this is a, a improvement over the optical communications and sensor demonstration in the sense that CLIC, one, the one you see on this chart, is going to be demonstrating inter-satellite uh, optical communications between two CubeSat space uh, craft, whereas the OCSD that I mentioned earlier was laser comm from spacecraft to ground and uh, a, a small data rate optical comm from ground to spacecraft. But in this case, we'll be demonstrating optical comm between two spacecraft using off-the-shelf parts. And uh, we will demonstrate data rates in this one up to 20 megabits per second at a range up to about 580 kilometers. We have a new uh, advanced composites-based solar cell system that we're going to launch in 2021. And uh, this one, if under the right lighting conditions, you should be able to see this with the unaided naked eye uh, as uh, it goes uh, in its position across in, the, in its orbit. The material that we're testing is not in the solar cell material itself. It's the booms that you see. So. Uh, Right in the very middle of the solar cell, you see the 12U spacecraft in which that solar cell material and its booms gets packed into. And with metal booms, we've noticed there's been a warping and twisting of metal booms on orbit for solar cells. So we're going to go to a new composites-based uh, boom that we will demonstrate when we uh, launch the spacecraft in early 2021. On the far right, I mentioned earlier that we would like to use small spacecraft in new mission architectures. In this case, we would be doing a, a what we call Starling, a distributed spacecraft mission in which the spacecraft are actually going to be autonomously communicating with each other and also doing formation flying as they move in their low Earth orbit around the Earth. And to give you a, a, a sample of what that means by formation flying, all four, when they're deployed, of course, are going to be subjected to uh, natural phenomena are drifting from each other, but the communications between the spacecraft, the spacecraft will be looking at the position of each of the other in the swarm, and there will be four of these. And if they start moving to the point where they start getting outside of the radio range of each other, three will command the one that is drifting farther away to make a movement and to come back into the fold of the Starlink uh, multi-spacecraft demonstration. So we hope that this will be a first demonstration of formation flying spacecraft for us that we would be able to use in the future when we want to put multiple spacecraft around a science object of interest and conduct multi-science data collection on that science object of interest. Two more that are coming up. 
These represent our uh, further extension into CIS lunar space. Capstone, the one on the right, is a very fast mission. We uh, started working on this in late August of last year, and we intend to launch this uh, in March of next year. This is a about a 12U size spacecraft. Uh, we bought them their own rocket. Matter of fact, uh, Rocket Lab, Peter Beck's company. Um, we bought a, a special rocket from him that has a photon third stage on it, which will allow us to get this spacecraft into what is called a near rectilinear halo orbit. That's a very special orbit. That is an orbit that we would eventually put gateway into, uh, and that is the we want to prove that the orbit is stable before we put the real uh, space station called Gateway into that orbit. So this spacecraft will have a propulsion system on board as well, but it will be doing ranging between the deep space network on Earth and a spacecraft that has been orbiting the moon since 2009 called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And so it, uh, its sole purpose is to demonstrate the stability of the near rectilinear halo orbit around the moon before we put the new next uh, space station called gateway into that orbit on the left is a lunar flashlight this is also a 6u size spacecraft that has a laser uh, payload on board that operates in four bands within a near infrared and we're going to be uh, zapping some of those darker craters particularly around the south pole to understand the quantity and distribution of surface ice deposits in that area since we think that's where we're going to be uh, landing uh, humans uh, on the moon when we go back uh, later this decade so as a quite as a summary for the small spacecraft uh, the organization that i'm running today uh, this is the uh, objective of this uh, particular organization is to do be very uh, use rapid and affordable missions to enable exploration and science activities, get us out to uh, new destinations while we're also enabling new mission architectures. Using these spacecraft, and, and if they lend themselves to it, they augment existing assets and future missions as ride-along packages or as deployable packages from those larger spacecraft, and also enable us to demonstrate from an early perspective technologies that will buy down the risk for technologies that could be used for future science and exploration missions. So that was mostly a, a quick overview of what my small spacecraft technology program is doing. And this is a schedule that we're uh, marching against for the next couple of years. And as you can see, we're kind of busy with each one of those dark triangles representing a launch and activity for each one of those missions. And now I want to switch to Kepler. Uh, this was um, the position I held as the program manager for the six years before I joined uh, the small spacecraft technology team. And this was uh, such a joy to be a part of this because I consider it one of the uh, more noble missions that uh, we've conducted within NASA in the recent past. And of course, its sole scientific objective was to determine the frequency. What is the occurrence rate of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone? of other stars within the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, this spacecraft was launched in March of 2009, and we decommissioned the spacecraft after nine and a half years in uh, November of 2018. And scientists are still pouring through the data, and there are discoveries still being made in the data for uh, planets and planetary systems that Kepler has detected. This gives you an idea of how it worked. And it's a simple animation, and we, it's worked very simply. If you were standing on the edge of our solar system and you looked back at our host star, you would see the Earth do this once a year. And it would take Earth, Earth, Earth about 12 hours to go across the, smirt, the surface uh, or the face of the sun. And we'd measure the change in brightness. And we want to see this for at least three times on every planet we discovered. And from that, of course, using Kepler's laws of planetary motion, you could determine the size of the planet, its orbital period, and also the relative distance from its host star. And that gave you an idea on whether that planet orbited in the so-called habitable zone of the star, that zone where we thought that you needed to be at, where water could pool on the surface of the planet. This was the original field of view we looked at through the uh, Cygnus and uh, Lyra constellation. 
and it was a rather large field of view that Kepler covered because we wanted to sample many stars simultaneously. And uh, that was the field of view we looked at for four years until we lost in the third year and in the fourth year separately reaction wheels. And we could not point the spacecraft properly at that field of view anymore. But we were able to recover the spacecraft even after those malfunctions to still point the spacecraft at other parts of the galaxy and continue searching for planets. Let's talk about results. And um, these three dots you see in this field of view were planets that were already had been discovered by other means, such as radio velocity techniques that were in Kepler's field of view. And um, the results were astounding. After four years, you can see the difference between those three and the 4,700 planets that Kepler had found in that uh, particular area. And they ranged in all sizes, from Earth-sized, super-Earths, Neptunes, and all the way up to giant planet size. In many cases, we found uh, planets that were much larger than Jupiter. We also found a planet that is as the size of our own moon. And we found planetary systems that harbor eight planets, just like our solar system does. But uh, it's, of course, with this mission, our mission data are biased. We only got to see four years of observation. If um, you were able to extend the mission for a number more years, I'm sure we would have seen more planets in the system and we would have seen planetary system probably with planets outnumbering our own. But uh, if you go to the NASA Kepler, I'm sorry, the NASA Exoplanet Archive, I want to, I just want to cut and paste this chart out of that archive to show you what we ended up with. The chart, the number I want to show you is in the middle. The candidates and confirmed planets in the habitable zone. There's 361. I think the key results, and this is the one I like to remind all audiences of, when you think about the results from Kepler, and there are two that I present to every audience that I speak with. Go outside at night, look up in the sky, and every star you see has at least one planet. Every one of them. And every fifth star 20% of the stars that you see has an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone that's based upon the statistical analysis of all of the planets that Kepler has detected in the four years of looking at its uh, original field of view and the almost five years of looking at different fields of view and what we call the Kepler K2 mission in which we had lost two reaction wheels but were able to still scan around the ecliptic plane, uh, looking at uh, the other parts of the galaxy, searching for exoplanets. So the results from Kepler were amazing. Uh, these are some of the, what I call the K2 mission counts. This is when we had to repurpose the spacecraft after we lost two reaction wheels. But nevertheless, we were able to find many planets going through this new, the new fields of view. Uh, and this is a summary count. If you go to the NASA Planet Exocarp, the number of planets, all exoplanets found by Kepler or other means continues to increase. This was a farewell view from Kepler. Uh, this is a, approaching the nine and a half year mark in which uh, we turned the spacecraft at one time just to image the Earth before we were going to decommission the spacecraft. And of course, Kepler is a photometer. It is not an imager as you are used to with images that come from the Hubble Space Telescope. And the, the Earth at 90, almost 96 million miles away from when we were uh, following the Earth around in a heliocentric orbit appears quite bright. And you can see the circuitry on the photo array being lit up by the brightness of the Earth as it's reflecting light into the Kepler Space Telescope. Now I'd like to shift gears, just present a couple of charts at the end that uh, has gotten some attention over um, in the recent uh, couple of months. And this was um, the Falcon Crew Dragon launch with two astronauts on board for the first time from US soil. We're launching US astronauts again uh, in after a hiatus of nine years. And uh, I love this image on the left with the Falcon F9 and also Crew Dragon on top of an early morning image. And of course, you can see the spacecraft approaching International Space Station. This image was taken just a few days ago when two of the astronauts 
were uh, doing a spacewalk outside the International Space Station, and they were doing some battery replacements for different battery compartments around the ISS. And uh, astronaut Chris Cassidy uh, snapped this photo, and you can see um, just to the right of center, the Crew Dragon spacecraft attached to the module and docked with it on International Space Station. Uh, someone sent me an email just a couple of days ago, and I think it's from a student from uh, a webinar I did recently with another institution in India and asked me how much longer are the astronauts going to be attached to the ISS. And there are capabilities they can stay up to 210 days from the day they dock. I expect they'll probably be coming home sometime in um, August uh, and because you want to recover the spacecraft because one of the test activities on this was making sure that the spacecraft performs properly with astronauts aboard and it makes us return to Earth and its parachute recovery into the ocean. This is just one more space uh, photograph of the Dragon uh, approaching the International Space Station. And you see the, the dark part up here at the 11 o'clock position. Those are solar panels. They help give uh, power to the Crew Dragon while it's in orbit and also while it's attached to the ISS. And I was somewhat taken aback when I saw some images of the inside of the Crew Dragon. And this was uh, our one of our first spacecraft that we built, and this is the, the Mercury series. And you can see uh, John Glenn, the astronaut, who later became a U.S. Senator, being almost stuffed into the small compartment that was inside his spacecraft. And you look at the evolution of the cockpits of spacecraft over time, and you can see Apollo 4 at the top, and you see the space, uh, the space shuttle in the middle, and then you see Crew Dragon here on the bottom, and you, of course, you can tell you're, you're looking at a cockpit, and, it, and of course the space shuttle looks like a, a cockpit for a civilian airliner, and Crew Dragon is looking a little more futuristic like some of the science fiction movies that we get to enjoy these days. And uh, this one gives you a comparison also of the Soyuz capsule with the three cosmonauts in the left, and you can see Elon Musk sitting in his uh, Crew Dragon capsule on the right, and uh, it's a little roomier. Of course, you, you, um, you take efficient use of space wherever you go because um, more weight means more lift that is required. So you want to be efficient in the size and weights of your spacecraft. But you can see we've made some improvements in the way we used to uh, versus the way we used to design spacecraft you know, decades ago. Two more that are upcoming that I thought you might find interesting. The one on the left is um, the Boeing version of Crew Dragon. They call it Starliner. This one with um, astronauts aboard is supposed to launch later this year. The one on the right is another uh, resupply capsule. This one is not man rated, so you cannot put astronauts in it, even though the company that uh, NASA is working on, uh, the spacecraft, which is called Dream Chaser, uh, is built by Sierra Nevada Corporation. This one is going to also be used to shuttle cargo back and forth between uh, the surface of the Earth and the International Space Station. As you can see, it looks just like a kind of a baby space shuttle in a sense. But um, those are two missions I'd like to bring to your attention that you may be able to uh, uh, web stream and also observe the launches for these two new spacecraft that will uh, go up later this year. Now, next month, I'm sorry, later this month, because it's July now, <laughs> uh, our new rover is going to Mars, and it's called the Perseverance rover, and you can see it in the background. It's a, a little more capable version of over the Curiosity rover. And this one is going to Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is, Jezero is an old Slavic word, which means lake. And it was, it was believed that a lake used to exist in this crater where this rover is going. And for the first time, we're going to have a Wright Brothers moment on Mars. This little helicopter you see will be the first time uh, that humans have flown a aircraft through the atmosphere of another celestial body. And I think I have an animation on this in, uh, in a minute, but this is in its final stages. You can see it here being uh, prepared for its installation on board the Perseverance rover. And uh, after Perseverance lands on the surface of Mars, 
uh, in early 2021. I think the land today is still sometime in late February of next year. Uh, one of the first things we're going to do is detach the helicopter and fly it through the Martian atmosphere. And here you can see this animation. And let this run for a minute. After it charges up, we take off. And the cameras, the cameras on board will observe the, space, the aircraft as it leaves the surface and then flies to a short distance away. This is a technology demonstration and um, it's gonna be just making a few flights and there will be some foot photographs that made for terrain mapping purposes to demonstrate a new terrain mapping activity. And uh, this is going to be an exciting thing, I think, for us to observe when we fly a aircraft through the atmosphere of another celestial body. So that's coming in early next year. There's one other thing I want to bring to your attention about this rover, Perseverance. And you can see these uh, engineers and technicians getting ready to install uh, these collection tubes into the bottom of the Perseverance rover. Since we are going to Jezero Crater, which we believe to at one time harbored a lake in uh, Mars's distant past, we're going to collect a number of samples around that lake and we're going to cache these collections in a particular area so that in the future, another mission which goes to Mars will retrieve these cached samples and return them to Earth for analysis. One more mission, and then I'll take some questions if we have time. Uh, we've had a spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx depicted in this uh, artist concept here. That's it been orbiting the asteroid Bennu. And October of 20th of this year, we're going to touch this particular part of the um, asteroid Bennu, and you can, if you can see my cursor, there's a little dark spot in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, just to give you a perspective on size, this boulder you see just to the left of that dark spot, it's about the size of a school bus. And uh, we're going to collect a sample just north of that kind of a darkish spot right there. And when we barely touch the surface of the asteroid, with the collection sample, which is, you can see it on the end here, we blow a nitrogen gas, coal gas, into that collection tube and it blows the debris up into that collection sample. And then you put it into this um, hat, I call it, on this side of the spacecraft. And that's what is going to return to Earth with the spacecraft. And this, this reentry capsule here will detach, reenter through. Um, uh, the Earth's atmosphere and be collected by NASA scientists for analysis of this sample that we're going to bring back from this asteroid. And uh, I just want to make sure that you're aware of those upcoming missions. I just want to uh, add those teasers there. If you were keen about new missions that are coming up, uh, be sure to set, search the NASA website, and I'm sure you can read more about the Ingenuity uh, helicopter and also the Perseverance rover and also about OSIRIS-REx. So um, that concludes the material that I wanted to present today, and I thank you for your time. Yes, thank you, Roger, sir, for a very phenomenal session. So uh, you re really left us mesmerized. So uh, I request the participants, whosoever have any question, they can post their question in the chat box window. So we can take them up. In the meanwhile, Sardana sir, you can share your comments. Hello, yeah. Uh, Anupam, will you be reading the questions to me? Is that how you want yes, to do that? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. I'll read it for you. Okay, thank you. Yes. So I request the participants, they can put up their question in the chat box window. 
and we can start taking them in the next two to three minutes. In the meanwhile, sir, you can interact. Yeah, Roger. The uh, how are the distances involved in collecting those samples? Maybe I missed those. I'm sorry. Uh, repeat that question again. The distances by which the samples are collected in the last uh, few slides you showed. Oh yes, yes. Um, let me go. Yes, back to this, this one. This very, very interesting. Yes, there's about four, there's about forty of these collection tubes I call them, and um, as the rover is making its way around the Jezero crater. It collects these, and then at one particular place, it's going to cache. I don't have the details on where it's going to cache these collection tubes in a place that a future mission to Mars will be able to retrieve those tubes that you see in here, which has collections from the surface of the Jezero crater, and then bring those back to Earth for analysis. So. Um, as a matter of fact, it's interesting. I was I noticed that recently JPL was looking for a deputy program manager for a Mars sample return mission, and I know they're referring to these particular uh, modules or tubules that you see in the middle of this photograph. And uh, I don't know what year that's going to happen. I, I still think that mission is under formulation because the Perseverance rover is going to operate for some time on the surface of Mars as it's conducting its science and exploration. And as it's also collecting these samples for deposit into a cache on the surface of Mars for that future mission to retrieve. Now, it, here's, a, here's an intriguing question and I'm not sure if um, for the students to think about, and it re refers to the Osiris Rex. And you're in a micro G environment and you have a requirement from NASA to bring back uh, X many grams of material from the surface of the asteroid Bennu. If you're in a micro G environment and you come down to the surface of Bennu and you blow nitrogen gas onto the surface and you blow it up into this collection device, uh, how much, how can you determine the weight of the material that you have inside your collection device? before you finally make the decision to do a turn and burn of the spacecraft to return to Earth. Because after it touches the surface on October 20th of this year, it's still going to, after it confirms that it has some material inside its collection device, it's going to move slowly back away from the asteroid and will stay there until uh, March of 2021 before it returns. But you want to make sure the principal investigators want to make sure that you've collected enough material inside this. So there's an interesting question for some students to do some investigation. How would you weigh the material that's inside your collection device when you're operating in a micro G environment? I'll leave that as a challenge to the students. <laughs> but what, what, what is that height part of it that I was asking? The height? The distance um, from the surface. Uh, it's, oh, um, where for the asteroid uh, over Banu? Yes, yes. Oh, they've been down as low as about 100 meters, I think, uh, over oh. the surface. And yeah, and I think this image here is about two centimeters per pixel. Um, so I had to go back and check that. And that's a good question. I know they've been. They've been very, very close to the surface to get this high resolution of an image. And uh, if I remember correctly, it's somewhere, I think about 150 meters above the surface, but um, it's in October is when they start slowly moving close enough. And I'm looking forward to those images too, but also when they get close to this little dark spot you see here, which is just to the top of that, is where they intend to collect the sample. Uh, so then, of course, they'll be, they'll be touching it, but it's supposed to be a very light touch uh, and then blow the nitrogen gas through that extension and into the capsule so they can blow debris, pebbles and dust, et cetera, up into the collection capsule 
uh, collection mechanism, then put that into the capsule that you saw on that one side. Yeah. So I don't know how much is the size of this image. Hello, Roger, someone has muted you. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. some, somebody muted me somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry about I don't. <laughs> I don't know how much you missed. Uh, I think someone was asking about um, this image, and I think it was about uh, two centimeters per pixel um, was the resolution on the image. I have to go back and check that. But so two kilometers, about two kilometers by two kilometers. Uh, no, about two centimeters no. per two centimeters per pixel, which I found was like it's a sharp image. If you go, uh, you go to the uh, Osiris Rex mission website, they have some very more detailed information. That's a good question. I remember reading that, but I did not memorize it. But there is, I was amazed at the resolution they're getting of these images because they were moving into about, I think it's about 150 meters above the surface of the asteroid. Oh, similar to the height. Yes, yes, uh, limited yeah. to that, yeah. Okay, yes. okay. okay. let's make sure I'm, I'm, I think I'm still good. I'm not muted. <laughs> Okay, next question, please. Yes. So, sir, next question is from Dr. MRM. So, he's asking that miniature space technology is changing time, uh, changing the entire perspective of spa space technology. So, could you comment on that? Yes, uh, I would. That's a very good question, and I would say, uh, yes, they are. Um, the current head of science for NASA is uh, Thomas Zerbuchen. And before he became head of NASA, he was uh, selected from the University of Michigan. And he is an advocate for small spacecraft for conducting science and exploration missions. To be fair, uh, there will be always be what we call the great observatories. Uh, it's signal is everything. And to get good signals on distant objects, you got to have aperture size. So when you look at Hubble, you know, you get a 2.4 meter collection mirror and you look at James Webb Space Telescope, which launches next year, it's uh, quite a bit bigger than Hubble. And you, there are certain things that you can do with small spacecraft and there are certain things you cannot do. However, we are trying to become a little cl more clever in the way that we could do small spacecraft technologies that can either augment or maybe, maybe, it's a big maybe, replace some of these large apertures by using small spacecraft in a dispersed or disaggregated manner. And I would uh, commend to you uh, the work of Dr. Dmitry Safransky at Cornell University in, uh, in New York. NASA awarded him a grant in 2018 to look at how small spacecraft technologies could be used in building a large aperture uh, spacecraft or a large aperture observatory. Let me give you an example of why would you want to do that. Uh, Kepler has detected many planets. The next step along the way of the exploration of those planets other than determining how many are out there and also understanding the characterization of the planetary systems that those planets occupy. We want to understand what is in the atmosphere of those planets. There was an amazing announcement in September of last year, and it involves the planet called Kepler's K2-18b. This was the first time that we have using two different spacecraft, the Hubble spacecraft and the Spitzer spacecraft, to detect the presence of water in an atmosphere of an exoplanet. And this planet was many light years away from us, but we want to be able to do that with even better resolution. And to do that, you need large aperture telescopes, larger than the James Webb Space Telescope, perhaps, if particularly if you want to make what we call that famous pale blue dot image that uh, Carl Sagan so um, enthusiastically wrote about when those first images were taken of the Earth as the Voyager 1 spacecraft was getting ready to, to leave our own solar system. If we want to image planets that are in our own stellar neighborhood, 
those planets that are up to about 25 to 40 light years away from us and be able to discern surface features of those planets. We're going to need very large apertures. And the James Webb Space Telescope, when it launches next year, is going to be the largest telescope that we have launched <clears throat> in the fairing of a rocket from the Earth. And we could barely squeeze it inside the fairing of that rocket. So think about how would you get a much bigger telescope than James Webb onto orbit? Maybe we should start thinking about using small spacecraft technologies to manufacture or assemble these large spacecraft in orbit. That is one of the paths that we're investigating now, and that is why the NASA Innovative Advanced Concept Group awarded a research grant to Dr. Uh, Dmitry Safransky and Cornell of, uh, in 2018 to start looking at ways that we could build these large aperture telescopes using technologies that we're developing today using small spacecraft technologies. So I think the, 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 I think the limit is our imagination. I think you, you look at what everybody on this uh, telephone call today, every one of you has a smartphone. I would imagine every one of you has a smartphone. You have thousands of times more processing capability in that smartphone than we had in Apollo 11. That shows you how far we've come in just a short amount of time. Uh, and where will we be going in the future? I think uh, it, the way the technology and electronics revolution is going, it, it's, I think it's, it's boundless. I don't know where we're going to end up. Only you can determine that. But at, while we're doing this, one thing that we have observed with Hubble and we will with James Webb and with Spitzer and Chandra, so far we have found only one planet that is habitable and it's the one that we stand on. There is no planet B. There is no plan B. This is it. This is our home. This is where we make our stand. And there are 7.6 billion souls on this planet today. And I usually bring this up in every opportunity to have is that uh, climate change is an existential issue for us and we have to address it. And I think we can. I think the, the some of the best ideas for continuing our existence on this planet will come from your generation, from the generation that is on this phone call today. And I'm hopeful for that. I'm hopeful for it because I think there are ways that we can live more sustainably and also maintain the harmony on this planet. I'm sorry, but I got on my soapbox there for a minute. <laughs> but because climate, climate change is, a, uh, is an important issue for all of us that, uh, that, call, that we call ourselves humans. This is, affects all of us. Thank you for the question. I'm sorry I got to carry it away there for a minute. Yeah, thank you, sir. So next question is from Aryan. So he's asking that, please, sir, comment on the space-based solar project. So what is NASA doing in the same, and what challenges <clears throat> they are facing? I presume you're referring to space-based solar projects in which we collect uh, energy in space and then beam it to the Earth. I mean, I think there's some studies in that area. I, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't have sufficient details to... Uh, tell you where we are with that. NASA is, uh, and the, the Space Technology Mission Director that I work for, uh, has a, a wide portfolio of technologies that we're investing in. Did you know that NASA is investing in thermal nuclear propulsion for rockets again? Uh, we're looking at that as an option in the future for uh, moving people around space using thermal nuclear propulsion. But uh, I don't have, uh, I would have to go back and look at some of the technologies that are related to solar-based, uh, uh, space-based solar power. I know we're, we're getting much better at doing it on Earth because uh, you look at the price of kilowatts per hour of power being generated by solar plants versus that of fossil fuels plants has gotten much better, it's much more attractive. So you're starting to see uh, a lot of solar farms being uh, installed around the surface of the planet. Will we get to the uh, future where we have space-based solar power? Uh, maybe. Uh, it, I think there's some technological challenges that should be that will have to be overcome to do that. Uh, but you know, that's how all projects start. You start with a challenge and you, by asking the question, "What if?" And then you proceed from there. But uh, I'm sorry, I don't have more detail for you on that question. I think that the Space Technology Mission Directorate. Could be in, it could be investing in that, but I have to go find some more details for you. Thank you for the question. Yes, thank you, sir. So next question is from Amrit Anshu. 
so he's asking that what qualifies an asteroid as potentially hazardous with respect to earth uh well uh of course it has to be on a collision course and uh, those are the ones you want to avoid <laughs> <laughs> okay it's um it, it, it's interesting because uh we have sufficient evidence to indicate that uh, this planet has been struck in the past severely enough uh, that is what you know led to the demise of the uh, dinosaurs according to a number of, of scientists that uh, it was an asteroid strike and if uh, you recall your recent history you think of the city in russia called chelyabinsk and that was a lucky day from one perspective because the asteroid was entering the atmosphere at a very glancing angle at about 13 degrees and so it had to transit through more of the atmosphere before uh, it disintegrated and a shock wave from the disintegration hit the city and of course there were some people injured there were no deaths but a lot of damage occurred that day but think about this we didn't even see that one coming we didn't see that one coming and it uh and it, we were also lucky that it came in at such a low grazing angle because if that asteroid had come in at a much higher angle, Chelyabinsk wouldn't be here today. We were lucky in that day. So, the, of course, the first objective of all of this uh, New Earth orbit, uh, NEO, they call it, uh, asteroid tracking, is to find them and, char and characterize their orbits. Where are they today? There's a mission I did not mention uh, in my presentation today called DART, D-A-R-T. You may want to go take a look at that mission. That one NASA is going to conduct. Also, we're launching in July of 21 with the intent of rendezvousing with a binary, binary asteroid system. There's uh, two asteroids. That there's a small one and a big one, and the small one is orbiting the large one. And we're going to do an experiment to see if we can deflect the orbit of the smaller one around the larger one with the intent of showing that there's technologies that we could readily have available in case a NEO a near-Earth orbiting asteroid that would be on a collision course with us, we could rendezvous with in a timely enough manner and deflect it away from harm against the Earth. So uh, I, I hope I answered your question. I hope I in, uh, increased your curiosity for go check out this mission called DART, D-A-R-T, the Double Asteroid Redirect Technology, because I think it's going to be fascinating to uh, watch NASA conduct that mission and when it launches in July of 2021 and then i i think it rendezvous with the asteroid about a year later and then we begin the experiment thank you for the question i anupma i can't hear you you're mute yes yes sorry sir so i was saying that as we are running short of time so we'll take one last question from the audience so audience want to ask about your comments on India's Chandrayaan 2 mission, Mars mission Chandrayaan 2. So your um, you muted. I didn't. I can't hear you. Yeah, I think someone in the participant. I, I, I think. Hello. Uh, yeah, I can yeah. hear you again. Yeah. Uh, hello. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we can take one last question uh, from uh, uh, what about the space garbage made of broken parts of rockets and satellites? How? Oh, yes, that's a really good question. Uh, are you going to help us solve that? <laughs> it's, it's becoming an issue. Uh, it already is an issue because uh, you've seen already there's been some collisions uh, among some spacecraft out there. And I think um, there's been a, a mission that was conducted recently as a technology demonstration. <coughs> and um, I'm having trouble recalling what the name of it was, but it was, uh, I think it was a European Space Agency and Australians were doing a mission together in which they were demonstrating two technologies. One was a net and one was a kind of a harpoon. Uh, but they brought their own target object with them because it was a technology demonstration so that they could demonstrate the possibility of capturing another piece of debris and doing something about it. There is a significant issue.
someone muted me. Okay, I'm back. Um, there's a significant issue growing with space debris, and uh, we're going to have to address it sooner than later. And I think it's not just a, a technical issue that has to be addressed, but there's a geopolitical issue because the laws of space are a little bit different than they are for laws on the surface of the planet. For example, you look at the laws of the high seas versus the laws of possession in urban. A, comp a, a government or a institution that launches something into space, that body belongs to that uh, nation or that institution in perpetuity. Whereas you go look at the laws of high seas, if something is abandoned on the high seas, it's whoever gets to it and you can, you, you can claim it, particularly if it's been abandoned. But that's not the way it works in outer space. We're going to have to change some laws and work those through the United Nations. But at the same time, I, I'm not a politician. I also am not a lawyer. Uh, I have to work with uh, different organizations to think about how you would technically address those issues. And it's becoming even more important, particularly as you see more private companies moving into space and they're launching thousands of, uh, of uh, satellites. Go look at uh, what Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX and his Starlink system and look at what OneWeb is about to do. We're going to have a we need a space traffic cop, <laughs> someone who can be able to manage the orbits of all these spacecraft so that we don't run into each other because we get to that point. We're going to deny the use of space to everybody. So we, it's an issue that must be addressed. Thank you for the question. Yes, thank you, sir. So to conclude and to end up today's session, I request our IGP branch counselor, Dr. H.K. Sidhana, sir, for a vote of thanks. Yes, thank sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roger Hunter, for sharing your explorations and bringing challenges, particularly the micro G challenge that you pose to the students. And they will see, in fact, they have, they are curious themselves to raise questions uh, on their own research uh, planning that they have, how, how and why they can also join. And I was happy to see that you shared so many universities participating uh, in such programs. So it seems there's a lot of opportunity and uh, you know, a lot of uh, curiosity that you have inculcated in research scholars. So as a token of recognition, of course, you have and appreciation from uh, the IEEE student branch. Uh, here is one uh, virtual certificate that we are sharing. Hope you will uh, enjoy this uh, in, in your spare moments as a memento. So uh, I hope uh, everyone is enlightened to, to get this space exploration on a virtual platform like this. And I find even the, the, the astronauts finding a lot of space now. You showed 2020, <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, compared to 1967 Apollo mission. I don't know how they were, uh, you know, sitting in that small space. So despite the space being too much, but the actual space for uh, their place was very little. So yes. nice, nice to see that the technologies have gone much higher in terms of size for their own vehicles, but but size enough size for the people, uh, and great to see that a lot of science and a lot of engineering and and also how these automation would would allow uh, working in different environments. A lot of automation robotics. Uh, I think people are excited, mm -hmm. and uh, let's see they will venture different uh, web pages that NASA has already placed in for various missions. And I hope they will go closer to you uh, in terms of uh, their research efforts. Thank you very much for being with us uh, on this day, just after the Independence Day of America. I hope everything uh, goes well all over the world and we come out of and conquer this pandemic and you know see the brighter side of this universe. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate you having my um, having me on with you today and allowing me to provide some information on NASA's small spacecraft and also Kepler and also just a glimpse of what's coming up for us. I think the, we live in exciting times while I also live in very challenging times. And I do want the students to tell me how they think they can weigh the sample inside the collection arm for the OSIRIS-REx when you're in a micro-G environment. That's a challenge, students, I'm holding you for. Uh, sir, if I may, one more challenge. I have one more challenge for the students. 
Uh, and it has to do with Kepler because that's my first love of, of missions because of the nobility of that mission. I may have mentioned that Kepler is on an Earth trailing heliocentric orbit. It follows us around the sun as we go around the sun. It takes Earth 365 and a quarter days to make it around the sun. It takes Kepler about 371 days to make it around the sun. So uh, two runners going around a racetrack. One day, Earth is going to lap Kepler. And that is in September 20th of the year 2060. I challenge the students on this telephone call today to go up and retrieve that spacecraft and bring it back and put it in a museum because it has fundamentally changed the way that we think about astronomy and has changed the way that we look at the galaxy. Thank you so much. Yeah, you, wonderful, sir. Thank you so much. We are really enlightened by your session. Yes, thank you all participants. Thank you. Stay safe, take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.